Hi, everyone. My name is Aliyah Hussain, and I work at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Welcome to today's event, From Guantanamo to Gaza, Resisting State Violence and Occupation. We're so happy to have you here. I want to thank my comrades and co-organizers, co Ali McCracken at, at Amnesty International and Dr. Maha Halal with Muslim Counterpublics Lab. In addition to CCR and MCL, special thanks and love to the Adela Justice Project for co-sponsoring the webinar and for their critical work. My CCR colleagues and I have represented dozens of men detained at Guantanamo since the prison opened and represent two of the 30 men who remain there today. Their names are Gulid Duran and Shirkawi Al-Hajj. Like the majority of the men, they both have been approved for transfer by the US government. Their continued detention is cruel and senseless and a failure of the Biden administration. Since Guantanamo opened in 2002, there has been a global movement condemning its existence. Together with Guantanamo survivors, family members, activists, lawyers, advocates, artists and storytellers have uplifted their stories of injustice, demanded the prison's closure and called for accountability for torture and abuse. We have accomplished so much together, but there is still much left to do. Tomorrow, January 11th, will mark 22 years since Guantanamo has been used to indefinitely detain Muslim men and boys in the so-called war on terror. These anniversaries are an opportunity to publicly recommit to this work, to stand in solidarity with the men inside, and when possible, hear directly from survivors, and engage in political education so that we can gain a deeper understanding of our shared struggles and be more powerful advocates. Unjust detention, torture and abuse, dehumanizing anti-Muslim narratives, and U.S. impunity are essential pieces of why Guantanamo remains open and why and how such brutal and unlawful practices are being replicated around the world. On one hand, I'm devastated that we're here, devastated that there's an unfolding genocide by Israel against Palestinians and with unconditional support from the U.S. Devastated that we're marking another year of Guantanamo and that President Biden has not done enough to make progress with complete disregard for the men who languish there. And devastated that this April marks 20 years since the horrific Abu Ghraib torture photos were made public, but there has been no real accountability or justice for the Iraqi survivors. But I'm also hopeful and inspired by being in this virtual space with our speakers today and by the number of people who are watching this right now and who have shown us how needed this conversation is. On this 22nd anniversary of Guantanamo, I couldn't imagine having any other conversation than this. It is only by making these connections that we can strengthen our movements. This is why we're holding this event today, to learn, build community, disrupt the US government's power to suspend human rights and elevate our collective demands for justice, accountability, and transformation. Before I hand this off to my co-organizer, Maha, who will help ground us today, I wanna to go over a few logistics. We have ASL interpretation on the screen. Thank you, Rashida. We have card captions at the link. I think someone will drop it there. And the panelists will be discussing torture, war crimes, and other deeply disturbing human rights abuses. So please take care of yourselves and take a step away if you need. The recording of this event will live at the same link. We will share links on the screen to resources and ways to get involved throughout the event. Please add your comments and questions into the chat and we'll do our best to highlight and respond to them. So again, thank you for being here. I'm really looking forward to this discussion and turning it over to you, Maha. Thank you so much, Aliyah, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be here with you all today. Um, as Aliyah mentioned, my name is Dr. Maha Hilal, and I'm the executive director of the Muslim Counter Publics Lab and the author of the book, Innocent Until Proven Muslim, Islamophobia, the War on Terror, and the Muslim Experience Since 9-11. 
So as Aliyah mentioned, we're here to commemorate the 22nd year of Guantanamo Bay's opening under the guise of the War on Terror. Far from stopping at Guantanamo Bay Prison, the U.S.'s carceral violence in the War on Terror has extended to Bagram Air Base, Abu Ghraib Prison, and numerous black sites across the globe. We mark this anniversary not just to emphasize the brutality of this infamous prison that has served as an emblematic symbol of institutionalized Islamophobia marked by the detention of Muslim men and boys, but also because of how it has served as a blueprint for other countries to emulate its cruelty. As we mark this solemn anniversary, we do so in the context of Israel's ongoing genocide of the Palestinian people that has continued unabated with the full throttled support of the US government. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, the US government sold the narrative that everything had changed. As Bush said in a speech on September 20th, night fell on a different world, a world where freedom itself is under attack. What made the world different, however, was not the 9-11 attacks themselves, but the US's hegemonic posture of victimhood that would be used to subsequently legitimize unfettered state violence. In the last two decades plus, the US's narrative of victimhood has endured remarkably, with countries such as Israel emulating the same to construct its own narrative of unique and exceptional victimhood, most recently after it was attacked by Hamas on October 7th. In order to seamlessly adopt the US's narrative of victimhood, Netanyahu likened the Hamas attacks on October 7th to the 9-11 attacks, asserting that, quote, on October 7th, Hamas murdered 1,400 Israelis, maybe more. This is in a country of fewer than 10 million people. This would be equivalent to over 50,000 Americans murdered in a single day. That's 20 9-11s. That is why October 7th is another day that will live in infamy, end quote. By making the connection between the Hamas attacks on Israel to the 9-11 attacks on the United States, Netanyahu was claiming the same motivation, irrational terrorists motivated by nothing other than hate, with no political reason to conduct an attack. And more importantly, and more dangerously, to lay the groundwork to enact a monstrous and catastrophic violent war, similar to how the US has unleashed and continues in the course of the war on terror. While the US and Israel's violence have always been intertwined and connected, this anniversary of Guantanamo's opening, the Israeli genocide of the Palestinians and reports of detention and interrogation conditions that Israel is subjecting Palestinians to, that mimics Guantanamo, made this conversation both natural and imperative at this moment in time. Moreover, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, and Gaza all have something in common, incarceration in the context of occupation, which adds an additional layer to the already existing violence of control and collective punishment that the United States and Israel have constantly and consistently subjected Muslims, Arabs, and Palestinians to, violence made worse by the free-flowing exchange of tactics of brutality. Additionally, it bears noting that this history extends much further back than 9-11, and each country has demonstrated a sustained commitment to torture in particular by receiving tutelage and training from France per its brutal occupation of Algeria and the use of its tactics to this day. The war crimes at Abu Ghraib acutely illustrate the violence of incarceration under occupation. When the photos of the war crimes committed at Abu Ghraib were released in 2004, it was during a period of heightened US intervention and occupation. The pictures of the tortured prisoners became symbolic of, as Joseph Puglis wrote in his article, Abu Ghraib and its Shadow Archives, of trophies of imperial conquest, and quote, the deployment and enactment of absolute US imperial power on the bodies of the Arab prisoners. Abu Ghraib specifically represented a nexus of American and Israeli violence because not only were torture tactics from Guantanamo Bay prison exported to Abu Ghraib, Israel trained American occupation forces in Iraq on the use of the quote, tactic of Palestinian chair, a stress position where detainees are made to crouch their bodies on the chair 
with their weight centered on their thighs. Recent reports from Palestinian prisoners and human rights organizations alike have put the spotlight on the torture tactics that Israel has deployed, which have been likened to Guantanamo Bay Prison, a prison built on the dehumanization and degradation of Muslim men and boys. The organization Euromed, for example, described the conditions of detention as an open air chicken coup, where prisoners were denied food and drink for long periods of time. And another article in 972 magazine described how Palestinians were rounded up and detained subjected to electrical shocks, cigarette burns on their necks and backs, sleep deprivation, and denial of access to bathrooms. Just as the Muslim men and boys detained at Guantanamo were rounded up on the basis of being, quote, suspected terrorists, images of Palestinian men crouching and stripped almost naked and blindfolded on the suspicion of being Hamas fighters invoke, the sim invoke similar imagery and the complete and utter dehumanization of those captured. To suffice it to say, just as the United States remains complicit in Israel's war crimes and genocide, both have benefited from the cruel detention and torture practices of the other. Guantanamo, however, has continued to remain a symbol of U.S. brutality, torture, the dehumanization of Muslim men, and the complete and total evasion of accountability for 22 years. One so iconic in its horrors that it is often the default comparison to instances of carceral violence in other countries. Rather than shying away from American brutality, Israel has taken it as a green light to justify its own cruelty. Our esteemed panel today will examine these overlapping rights issues and help us understand how to chart the path forward towards meaningful accountability. So with that, I will hand it back to Aliyah. Thanks so much, Maha. I'm really excited to bring our speakers now into this conversation. Um, I'll read very short bios. There's so much more that these folks do, and, and hopefully they'll they'll talk more about that work too. Um, so Mansour Adafi is a writer, artist, activist, and former Guantanamo prisoner held for over 14 years without charge. Mansour was released to Serbia in 2016, where he struggles to make a new life for himself and to shed the designation of suspected terrorist. His memoir, Don't Forget Us Here, Lost and Found at Guantanamo, was released in August 2021. He works at Cage, he works at Cage as a Guantanamo project coordinator. Catherine Gallagher is a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. She works on universal jurisdiction and international criminal law cases involving US and foreign officials and torture and other war, for torture and other war crimes, and civil actions involving private military corporations and torture at Abu Ghraib. Sahar Francis is a Palestinian lawyer and human rights defender and the general director of the Ramallah-based Palestinian human rights organization, Adamir, Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association. Her work focuses on Palestinian political prisoners and administrative detainees. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Um, I think I'm going to um, ask the first question, um, and this is to Mansour. Welcome, Mansour. Um, in order to wage the war on terror and create Guantanamo, the U.S. had to propagate narratives that dehumanized and demonized Muslim men. How do those narratives still impact you and others who are released? And how do these narratives keep Guantanamo open today? Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, before I start, I think Maha Hilal has requested a gift to the audience. So I will start. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya hala wa marhaba. Arhibaw. Hayakum Allah ahlan wa sahlan. Wa marhaba malyun. Basically, this is a Yemeni uh, greetings to you and to the guys who are listening here. So it means peace be upon you all. And welcome and many welcome. So before we dive deep into Guantanamo and fly there, you know, it's not just a narrative. It's actually a policy. It is, you know, uh, a policy that, set, policy that, a policy that set, was set up by the United States to legalize torture and violation of the human rights and invasion countries. So before we go that and talk about, you know, the, the narrative, Always the media try to shift the audience away from looking back 
for example, what what the life was before 9-11, what the life was before 7 October. So in order to analyze and to understand what led to 9-11, what led to 7 October, we have to look back years later, so the year, previous years to understand what led to that. So the United States, after the attack on 9-11, as you know, the United States announced the war and terror, a global war on terror. So it seems, you know, and they announced that they will bring people to justice who are responsible for 9-11, right? And before they they before what they, they did, they also manipulated the language and changed the terminology of the of what actually happened. For example, Ali or a lawyer and an expert in that, they changed what they call, you know, torture. It is just enhanced interrogation technique. It sounds sweet, like you can drink it with a cup of milk. And prisoners of war, they call them, you know, uh, detainees. And um, collateral damage, like the actual victims. So it, it is a well-engineered and planned and a setup to legalize cri uh, crimes against humanity and torture and abuses and, and so on. So Guantanamo, uh, still open for the last 22 years and tomorrow it will be exactly 22 years and i can tell you that gaza and the prison plus time are worse than guantanamo because when they used to torture us at guantanamo the, the interrogators they would threaten us to send us to israel to be interrogated there even in the egyptian in the egyptian prison in, in during the black even the black side, the brother was threatened to be sent to Israel or to bring Israeli uh, interrogators. And I can't tell you in Guantanamo, there was Israeli interrogators there. In, in also, in, 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 uh, there, was, there was interrogators from many countries. So I can say that at least at Guantanamo, we were safe. In like when I was watching the news in 2010 after our we get the little freedom in the detention. I was telling my brothers, you know, at least here we are safe. There is no drone attacks. We are, we don't have missing limbs. Now, what you see in Gaza, nobody is safe. Gaza is like a prison. Literally, it's worse than one time. Now, I'm not talking about the Israelis prison. I'm talking also about Gaza. The, the Gaza become like worse than a prison, worse than uh, Guantanamo where people can die at any moment. There is no safety, no security, whatsoever. So United States, by keeping Guantanamo open, it's like strong message that they do not abide by any law or by any conventions. And they, they use government signal that they can do as far as they, uh, as they want. And it's not legalized. It's Guantanamo, by keeping Guantanamo open, it gives some kind of legit, I'm kind of say legitimacy, but a way of legitimate be other countries would take it like Israel, like other countries who created their own Guantanamo with their own set of rules and so on. So, uh, what else? I I, <laughs> I, I, I went away from the question, sorry. No, 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 that's great, um, Mansoor. And actually that's a great segue to the next question and we'll hear more from you soon, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so our next question is for Sahar. So Sahar, given your work at Adamir supporting Palestinian political prisoners, what role has incarceration played in the perpetuation of Israeli occupation and now its ongoing violence and genocide against the Palestinian people? So good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for including me in this very important discussion. What I wanted to highlight is the fact that Israel started to use incarceration and detention as the main tool of the state for oppressing the Palestinian people much, much before 1967, the year of the occupation. Actually, it's, it started as a policy right with the uh, 1948 Nakba, after the Nakba and the establishment of the state and they implemented the policy for administrative detention, uh, arresting thousands without any judicial uh, uh, 
procedures, but based on secret information, the same policy that we saw in the Guantanamo and then in Israel today in the context of uh, Gaza and the occupied territories were used immediately after the creation of the state against hundreds of Palestinians who remained in the state and they were living under military uh, control up till 1966. Israel were using torture, arbitrary detention, and all the violations and the development, if we review the development of the torture policies in the Israeli context, we can really understand how they managed to bring this experience for the international level and how they teach the United States and other countries uh, about the techniques of torture and how they developed from very severe physical torture to methods that cannot leave marks on the body. Maybe later we can dis discuss more on the uh, specific issues, but I would say that Israel invented the terror, like the use and the weaponizing of the excuse of fighting against terror much before the United States did it after the attacks on 2001, because Israel was using the same techniques to illegalize and criminalize hundreds of thousands of Palestinians based on the military orders that claiming that all political parties are illegal which means they are terrorists and attacking and undermining the existence of the state of Israel. This is the policy how Israel were weaponizing detention and, and, and it's just because it managed to run away without any accountability. We see today uh, such extreme use of the detention as the main tool of oppression and control over the whole society. Thanks so much for that, Sahar. Um, now, Katie, this question is for you. We've worked together at CCR for a very long time, and I know that you've done accountability work really on, on all of the issues we're talking about today. So looking forward to getting your thoughts on some of the through lines. Um, but this qu question is specifically to bring Abu Ghraib and the US occupation of Iraq into um, the conversation. So how do you see Abu Ghraib um, connected to these other sites of violence and, and anything else you wanna say on um, connecting some of the dots? Thank you, Aliyah, and thank you so much um, for inviting me to be part of this panel on an anniversary that I cannot believe is happening with Guantanamo Bay still open and men detained there and a genocide happening right now um, in the occupied Palestinian territory by Israel with the support of the United States. So this is a, a very um, stark and somber moment. Um, and I'm really grateful to be with you all. Maybe just picking up first before I move to Iraq on Sahar's comments about the interrelationship between Israel and the United States. Um, I do think we see this back and forth with one country maybe testing out the boundaries of legality or illegality how far it can push, whether it's administrative detention, what we've seen in, in the occupied Palestinian territory for almost 20 years before we got to 9-11 and the opening of Guantanamo and black sites. It had been normalized. Israel has been a testing ground for the United States to, to justify and normalize unlawful behavior. So we see that with administrative detention, detention without charge, let's call it what it is, extrajudicial detention, unlawful detention. We've seen it with so-called targeted killing, which is really extrajudicial execution. It's a practice that Israel has carried out for decades now in the occupied Palestinian territory and beyond. And it is something that we've seen um, the United States do. And the redefinition of torture, what Israel had long tried to do and succeeded in doing, the United States under the administration of George W. Bush 
um, then tried to codify into law and certainly put into practice at Guantanamo and elsewhere. Um, so I, I think it's not simply the practices, but it's trying to change the law. That is actually what both of these countries do and frankly have done with too much success um, because they have really led to an erosion of the international legal framework that is supposed to protect detainees, protect populations under occupation, protect civilians. And so there is a reinforcing. And I think what we see now that we are at a moment of genocide in Palestine and Guantanamo with men still there for decades without charge who are largely and forgotten, save for the incredible work of people like Mansour and Aliyah and Maha and others, um, because it's been normalized, these ideas. And so I think where that takes us to Iraq, what we saw there was the United States doing a, a preemptive strike, um, one that did not have the backing of the Security Council, there was no legitimate claim of self-defense and the United States attacked Iraq and then occupied it um, and caused incredible damage and in, in human suffering and degradation to that country um, that lasted for years and, and the effect of it continues. And in the case of the United States, I believe that part of the um, inspiration for doing that was not solely about hegemonic power, um, it was also about profit. And what we saw in the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq was that these were the two biggest outsourced um, armed conflicts that existed. So there, was, there were private military contractors, private security companies, and of course, many, many corporations, especially with oil, um, who made tons of money because of unlawful occupation by the United States of Iraq. And so when we talk about the story of Abu Ghraib and the individuals who were detained there, it is somewhat different from Guantanamo and the black sites insofar as the United States recognized that the Geneva Conventions applied there. But the degradation and the erosion of standards led to what we saw in those notorious photos, the, the 20th anniversary of those photos being this April. Um, and it, it happened, as we've seen from military reports, with the support and encouragement even of private military contractors who were acting, acting in Abu Ghraib against Iraqi civilians, men, boys, some women who were detained without charge, picked up again as suspects and terrorists. So this framing of, of terrorism and the threat of a terrorist to justify anything, whether it's torture or now genocide, um, I think we also have to, to be careful and watch out for uh, when there are corporate and profit interests that are also driving some of these agendas. Um, and so we at CCR, as Leah, you well know, we've been litigating um, for almost 20 years now, the cases against a private military contractor at Abu Ghraib, CACI, on behalf of former Iraqi detainees who had been tortured in the hard site of that prison. And we can talk more about the fact that we're now set to go to trial many, many years later um, this April. So accountability is long and hard fought, but we hope that we will have some measure there. Thank you all so much um, for your answers and um, giving us all this context um, from which to understand these overlapping issues. We wanted to just sort of stop here for a moment and see if any of you wanted to reflect or comment on what um, the other panelists have said. So if you have any reactions or reflections to um, each other. I may just wanted to highlight um, Kate's point on the redefinition or testing the international standards 
in international law by both Israel and the United States in order to set precedent, whether on the torture and the uh, arbitrary detention, military court system in the occupation context and so on. Because really it is very important to understand what the United States and the Israelis are trying to do for the international law mechanisms and bodies on the global level and how it would affect not just Palestinians or Iraqis or Afghanis, it would set precedents for the whole civilians in the, in the, in the global level. And if frame like Israel invented something that even in the United States, it's not named in the same way, the illegal competent uh, uh, context in the, uh, the, the war against terrorism, in the international law, you can be either a civilian or a competent. And they are managing to go away with this terminology without any accountability. And this is why we should strategize and think collectively how we can fight such uh, uh, practices in the international level. Thanks for that, Zahar. And that actually tees up a question that um, that we had just based on, you know, the, the focus a little bit on the role of law. Um, you know, really, I mean, as I'm not a lawyer, but I work with lawyers. I see how, um, you know, it can be a tool for um, people and it can be a tool used against people. And so the question is really just um, what is the role of law and accountability when Israel and the U.S. have shown how malleable it is? Um, and I think you probably all have examples, but in what ways can it be a tool for survivors? Um, I think we've heard a little bit about how it can be weaponized, um, but feel free to share more. But also, like, how can it be and how do you use it as a tool for survivors um, in the current systems, as flawed as they are, that we have? To be honest with you, you're asking me this question in this specific time where me as a lawyer trying to use these this international law framework for more than 25 years and seeing the, ge the genocidal actions in Gaza with all what's going on with the detention issue and, and, and the thousands of people that they are subjected for arrest, torture and ill treatment now, I'm totally paralyzed. And I'm so frustrated that this is very uh, um, difficult actually to see, to try to seek justice uh, um, in the same, uh, um, using the same legal tools. So I hope that like big cases, like the case tomorrow that should be discussed in the ICJ or what, ki what kind of a difference that the ICC as the International Criminal Court can bring on the level of accountability or the use of universal jurisdiction in the context of the Palestinian cases, because maybe you were lucky as, as a center, as lawyers in some Iraqi cases or Afghani cases or even Syrian cases in the European uh, courts or in, in the United States, but never a Palestinian victim were reaching this level where the perpetrator were of torture was found accountable in any legal system, not inside Israel in the local system, not outside. So it's really very difficult to see how states are weaponizing international law and law, even the internal law. And this is why I think we should think collectively how we are supposed to face these uh, uh, um, double standards and and find the way how we can bring justice for the people. Thanks, Kate. I want to. I want. I do want you to answer this question to you, especially with our um, Abu Ghraib trial coming. But actually, Mansoor, I want to just bring you in to also answer this as someone who, while at Guantanamo. You know, your your lawyer, your you know, litigation was one way of access and sort of shining a light on 
your experience and others, but now as an activist, um, how and do you see law as a tool that helps in this work? Um, and if not, um, you, you know, why not? And, and sort of how have you used activism to kind of fill that gap? Hey, Alia, welcome back, guys. So basically, what, what I'd like to say highlights something, one really important point that when the United States announced a global war on terror, now we seen we are we we are seeing another war on humanity. I'd like to highlight before I answer your question this this really important point, where you know the attack on Gaza is not just on Gaza; it attack on all humanity because now, as you see, many journalists, lawyers, activists, uh, employees, ordinary people being targeted if they express their sympathy, wearing scarf. Palestinian flag. So many people were fired, punished, police around the world. Like what we are, we are seeing now, people try to stop the genocide, to express their sympathy. They are being, they are being punished. So I see it honestly, it is war and humanity and at every level, every country, in every, in every institution. So when you talk about the rule of law, the lawyers and so on, actually those governments, like in the state Israel and so on. And they are using the, the same tactic, the rule of law, the, the law to legalize their actions, playing with the terminologies, uh, reframing, renaming the, their actions and so on, and also act with impunity. So when we were in Guantanamo, lawyers have no effect, all they can do you know, they are being monitored, you know, because Guantanamo was created outside of the legal, legal system, outside of justice, outside of our humanity. So basically, what kind of law should be applied there if, if everything from the beginning was baseless? When you talk about, for, for example, the military commission at Guantanamo, broken system, nothing has been achieved for the last 22 years. You know, even when you're being, for example, the administrative reviews at Guantanamo, where even are being cleared, it's just nothing. No court can order your release. You're not allowed to bring your court be, uh, your cases before court. So, so the the system is, is is broken, especially U.S. justice system. So, using the rule of law or employing the the, the rule of law, it actually have no has no effect on those countries because they are in power, and they have also backed up by other countries. Like now, what happened what happened in Palestine, Israel, honestly, the way I see it is just an American military base, the way with the fund, with the weapon, with everything. And many countries fund this kind of like a military base. And in Guantanamo, as you see now, 30 million men there have seen have been cleared for release. Some of them have been cleared since 2009 and 10, yet they're still there. And the lawyers can do nothing to get them out. Everything like, well, it's a political case. Well. We are working the case. So the lawyers themselves found themselves also victims of the uh, uh, misuse and abuse of uh, power. So as you know, what happened in, in Gaza, we are saying genocide. And who is taking actions? South Africa is taking some, some actions. We haven't seen any kind of really international action on from, taken from government that can have some influence. No, I, I mean, we're talking about people who go to the street to protest, peaceful, we are talking about peaceful protests, being, being targeted, imprisoned, detained, punished, fired. So lawyers also the same thing. So what kind of, if you have the law, you didn't have the, the force, the mean, the tool to enforce the, the law, it becomes just a text on the paper, nothing. So when you, what I conclude that, you know, it's up to us all as human to keep the, to fight injustice and speak out and especially we depend on those uh, uh, lawyers experts in the field. Thanks, Mansoor, and thanks for highlighting to um, the predicament that we find ourselves in in U.S. courts around Guantanamo that even though they're kind of an independent branch, there's so much deference to the United States, um, especially for the cleared men, deference that the U.S. is doing all it can do to transfer them, right? And um, we know that that pressure, if it's not coming from the court, has to come from somewhere else. Um, before we move on, Katie, I know you 
you have some thoughts on um, on law as um, kind of a way to get accountability. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about Abu Ghraib and um, how that case is one way, but um, you know what what justice could potentially look like in that work outside of the courtroom too? Sure, and I have to say. Um, what both Sahar and, and Mansour said about the limitations of law are are things that I share. Um, and I share similarly to Sahar, 25 years of trying to um, work and 17 years now at CCR, often just feeling like we're hitting a wall. And that, that happens when we try to hold the powerful to account. Um, but I am not willing to see that space. And I see human rights law, international humanitarian law. I see that not as a law of war, but international humanitarian law. And the purpose of it is to try and preserve our collective humanity and protect our humanity. Um, and we are definitely fighting against states who have built this legal infrastructure to protect themselves, their power, their interests. Um, but I do think that there are ways that we can still use the law. Sometimes it's in a lawsuit and in a case, and I, I see a question there about the ICC um, for, for Guantanamo, and I do wanna to get to that at some point, whether it's right now, Aaliyah, or, or after. Um, but the, those legal frameworks are also used more popularly. And so I think whether you're looking at within almost UN structures where complaints are made to UN special rapporteurs, pushing them to try and have these values and principles that are ultimately what this law is about, the right to be free from torture, the right to be free from arbitrary detention, the right for self-determination. When we have UN special representatives and rapporteurs and working groups um, reaffirming that every individual, be it in Palestine, in Guantanamo, in, in Bangladesh or, or wherever it may be, has the inherent right to freedom, equality, dignity, and self-determination, there is value in that. And something like the case of, of our Abu Ghraib plaintiffs, I've represented 338 former detainees um, in US federal courts. And exactly what Mansour said about the, in, the, in the case of the first case, on behalf of 252 people, the court was unwilling to touch this case even though it was not against the US government, it was against private military contractors because they felt it was beyond um, the, the law, the, the courts, because it, had, it was political in nature. And that when you're talking about fighting wars or occupations, you know, this is not something where people on the field should be worrying about law. I mean, a pretty shocking decision. And then the second case we managed to settle on behalf of 71 men. And now we are down to the last case on behalf of three individuals who have been riding a, a, a roller coaster of sorts in the litigation for 17 years um, to get to this point of having their day in court. Their case has been dismissed. We have fought up on appeal number of times. And these are, are men who were held in Abu Ghraib back in 2003. And here we are in 2024. And to be asking them to go back at this moment, it, while it's a, a good thing that we finally have this trial, it is also a very difficult thing. So I think the quest for justice, it should not fall only on victims. It should fall on societies. We, should, we in the United States should have had and still could have people's hearings and people's tribunals so that more fully everyone in the United States understands what was done by us or in our name and in our name um, to people in Iraq, to people in Afghanistan, and frankly, in many other places in, in the world. Um, and I think the law gives us a certain language to talk about values and principles and what the expectations are of how individuals should be treated. Um, we did try and hold U.S. officials accountable for torture at Guantanamo and CIA black sites in a number of courts, starting in the United States, 
And then in France, Spain, Switzerland, Canada, um, Germany, and those countries were unwilling to hear a case against U.S. officials, as even as they now are hearing cases against Syrians um, or or people from Rwanda who were involved in the genocide. And certainly those cases should be heard, but so should the cases against U.S. officials or Israeli officials. Um, the court should be open to all. So we ultimately did bring that case to the International Criminal Court. And despite tremendous pressure by the Trump administration, we did have a successful opening of an investigation into U.S. torture by the International Criminal Court, affirmed by the Appeals Chamber, and that we had that victory in um, March 2020. I represent two individuals who are still detained in Guantanamo, Sharkawi al Haj and Ghali Duran in those ICC proceedings. And what we saw happen when a new prosecutor came in, he deprioritized or effectively shuttered the investigation into U.S. torture. So the, the courts are not definitely not the answer, but I think they are an important place that we continue to bring these cases. And that is part of why right now the Center for Constitutional Rights is representing Palestinians from Gaza, Palestinian Americans, and two Palestinian human rights organizations, Defense for Children International Palestine and Al Haq, in federal court in California at this moment in a case against Joe Biden, Antony Blinken, and Secretary of Defense Austin for their failure to prevent the genocide in Gaza and their complicity in it by continuing to lend all kinds of military, financial, and diplomatic support. Now that is a maybe not the easiest case to bring, but I think it was an important case to bring. And we are fighting that case hard. Um, we will have argument at the end of this month. Tomorrow, of course, is at the International Court of Justice, another case for genocide. But I think what this case helped do when you saw people on the streets in the United States and around the world holding up signs saying genocide, stop the genocide, our case helped explain factually and legally why those signs are right. Unfortunately, tragically, there is a genocide happening and there are legal obligations and we need to have those enforced. So I think we can stand silent on the sidelines at moments like this. And even when the court cases are difficult and the courts may not be ready for the kinds of cases we need to bring in order to have justice, we have to proceed. And then we also have to help and work with advocates and activists on the streets, in centers of power, in the arts, elsewhere, to try and again, give life to the principles the values that are inherent in these laws. It's not for the law in and of itself. It's for the humanity that is ultimately the, the very purpose in my mind of why we have international human rights and, and humanitarian law. Thank you all so much again for such insightful and um, really robust responses. So, um, there's this quote from Ta-Nehisi Coates who says, if I don't think you're human, there's only a certain amount of, or a certain range of policy that I'm going to apply to you. And I bring that quote up because of the ways in which dehumanization is such a huge part of the reason why Muslims, Arabs, Palestinians cannot receive any justice, nor is there any accountability. And oftentimes it feels like what's being adjudicated is not the law, but instead their humanity. So what are the ways in which you have been able to successfully challenge and push back against the dehumanization of these communities, of Muslims, of Arabs, of Palestinians? And what, you know, what can we do we have a broader question at the end in terms of what can we do as communities, but what are the ways that we should be challenging the dehumanization of these communities? And this question is for all of you. So whoever wants to go first. Yeah, let me start. First of all, 
to encounter the dehumanization and dehumanization of human being. First of all, we need to sow their asses. We need to bring, we need to have accountability and justice. So we need to see people brought before justice, first of all. Because when you see what happened now in Gaza, what happened, what happened after none of this, first of all, they demonized the people, terrorized the worst of the worst, and they said about us in Guantanamo. Imagine, like, those are vicious killers. So what they did, they do this kind of picture, this kind of frame of the prisoners, of the human being, you know, and taking people without, you know, suspicion, without any kind of legal process, torture and prison and so on. So again, the control of the narrative, for example, Guantanamo, I'm talking about Guantanamo because from my experience, Guantanamo, one of the most secretive prisons in the world and the most expensive one. Until that day, we are a struggle, you know, to counter the U.S. narrative about Guantanamo because a lot of secrecy. So keeping secrecy is they can control the narrative. So what we need to do, we need to encounter the, the policy of, you know, dehumanization by bringing awareness, speaking out, educating people, protesting, activism, and, and, and so on, and also calling for justice and accountability. This is really essential and important. You know, even now, if they, for me, if you ask me what was going to happen, means, I will tell you, it's not just shutting down the, 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 the physical place, but we need apologize. We need the US government to apologize, to acknowledge its wrongdoing, to compensate um, the, 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 the survivors. And uh, there must be accountability. You know, people like General G. Freeman, he wasn't going in Guantanamo, in Abu Ghraib, and in Iraq, who established the architect of Abu Ghraib. Where is he now? George W. Bush, and so on. Accountability, it is part of the uh, encounter the, to counter the uh, dehumanization, but also uh, speak, you know, like fighting for the, for the truth is really hard, you know, like controlling the narrative, the media, and so on. So I don't want to go far. far. It's just like that, I think about it. Now I become like, become doing activist writing, engaging every single day, wearing the beautiful orange color. One of the things, tea, to shed uh, light on our humanity. Because when they brought to Guantanamo in orange jumpsuit, this terrorist. So I'm wearing orange suit every single day, orange color every single day. Yes, I was in Guantanamo. I am a former Guantanamo team. This is who I am. I was there. So I'm using Guant our Guantanamo against theirs. So, yeah. Wow. Well. Allow me to come after Mansour on this, because I think this is very powerful answer for the dehumanization that we are facing every day for decades. And I allow me as well to, to give you some statistics and, and facts about what's going. And it wasn't just happening after the 7th of October and all this genocide uh, on Gaza, that the dehumanization by using the law and the military orders in the Palestinian context is, is unprecedented, I would say. The way how the uh, occupation managed to rule and, and develop laws and military orders and procedures for every single uh, act part of our daily life by illegalizing almost every political action that we can do as Palestinians in order to justify our imprisonment and, and high sentences and to claim that we are terrorist societies. And there's like hundreds and thousands of examples. Uh, just take uh, uh, our example as organizations, Adomir is one of seven organizations working for four decades as le at least to face uh, uh, violations and war crimes, and we were designated as a terrorist organization. This is the way how you weaponize law and secret information and legal procedures in order to silence, oppress, and control the society. So what happened after the 7th of October, the number of daily arrests and the number of the Palestinian detainees increased 
in a very, very sharp way. Currently, we are talking about more than 8,800 prisoners. This is not including prisoners from the Gaza Strip. These are just prisoners from uh, uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem and some tens from inside Israel that they are uh, uh, arrested, detained in very violent ways, subjected for torture, ill treatment, uh, um, healthcare neglect. Already seven detainees died inside the Israeli prisons since the 7th of October till today. And the increase in the use of administrative detention against children, against women, journalists, political leaders, students, everyone became a target for the policy of detention. There's more than 3,291 administrative detainees. This is the highest figure of uh, administrative detention uh, uh, since the occupation on uh, 67. It's a continuous process and all of, all of this are taking place with huge silence from the Israeli society and from the international community, I mean on the level of accountability. No one is interested to speak about and to fight the torture and the death of the seven uh, uh, Palestinian prisoners. If you want to discuss the prisoners from Gaza, this is really like the, the videos and I'm sure lots of you so part of the pictures of the naked prisoners, the humiliation, the degrading treatment, and the awful thing. And literally, they're held in military camps that, in the description, very similar to what was taking place in, in Guantanamo. This is for me, and, and you should know that immediately from day one, all the related, uh, uh, whether civil laws or military orders, were amended in order to give an answer on the practical level, how they are supposed to arrest thousands, and it would be easy for them to control and to arrest them and to justify their arrest. So actually, they know very well which amendments to do to the law immediately in order to make it look as if it's done by law. So this is why it's really very frustrating to think about legal answers for these dehumanization actions. It doesn't mean that I give up being a lawyer or, or trying to exhaust the legal uh, procedures that I have, but I think we have to start to think more about the kind of activism that Mansour is thinking about and, and not just to be limited for the Palestinian cases or for the victims of uh, uh, the U.S. different uh, uh, policies, because I'm afraid what Kate was saying about the law, that it was supposed to be the tools of the protection and to save our humanity, this is the most important thing that now we should think about in the whole discourse of what's going on in Gaza because it's not just about Gaza and the Palestinian people. It's about our humanity as human beings and our dignity and the kind of world we want, we want about our future that we want to live in. And this is why we, we should joint efforts and think about ways how we can fight all these policies. If I can come in and just build on really the the powerful um, interventions on on how we help to ensure that the dehumanization isn't what what is the only thing that people know about places, but they know who the people are, and and looking at the questions in the comments, um, just to use a very concrete example of sort of how we turned with the help of, of artists, um, turned the dehumanization almost on its head. Um, the, the photos that are coming out of prisoners in Gaza right now are, are, are just horrific. And they there are so many connections to the photos um, that came out of Abu Ghraib. 
And we were approached after we filed the lawsuit. And of course, in filing a lawsuit, many of the plaintiffs, of course, not all of them, but many of the plaintiffs, their names are there, some details about who they are, um, what has happened to them, but who they are. So in part, you're also starting to put a name to an, a, you know, anonymous numbers or, or hooded individuals and, and starting to tell their story. But when we filed the first case, we were approached by a fashion photographer who saw the dehumanizing, anonymous, cruel photos of Abu Ghraib and said, well, I'm a photographer. How, what can I do to try and help to bring some dignity back in the, in, in the aftermath of such humiliating conduct and photos that the world has now seen? So he traveled with us um, for client meetings in, in a third country, and he took beautiful, dignified, proud photos of a number of our plaintiffs. And he spoke with them and recorded some of their words and some of their stories. And those photos by Chris Bartlett have now traveled around the United States. So while we haven't had our day in court, those individuals' faces in very beautiful photos with some of what their story is, and that may be what happened to them at Abu Ghraib, or it may be who they are outside and beyond of Abu Ghraib. They have been in um, public libraries, universities, cultural centers around the United States and around the world. And with the help of, of Aliyah, two of our clients traveled to Geneva at the invitation of the UN Working Group on, on Mercenaries. So this is a way where you're kind of putting these pieces together. Um, where Chris Bartlett's photos were were um, displayed. So it's a way that you are, again, giving um, dignity and giving identity back instead of it, it being stripped away. Um, and there are also other ways in, in litigation beyond the, the arts. I mean, we've, we've also participated, our clients have participated in, in films that have been made or in podcasts. And, and the litigation helps to give some um, outlet and, and awareness for those who are interested in actually talking to and, and learning the stories of, um, of those who are victims and survivors of, of these cruel practices um, and the complaints themselves and the litigation themselves. And I would just here again, highlight the case that we filed the Gaza genocide case against Joe Biden. Um, we put in a brief on December 22nd. And with that brief, we had a number of declarations from our plaintiffs. And so the stories of what they are enduring, what they have lost, the fear that they are living with every day, those are out there now. And um, they have been also put in, in news stories, but they are there as part of the permanent record. And particularly those accounts from Palestinian Americans to their president. Um, I think that that's also a powerful way to, to bring humanity and, and, and um, individual experiences to the fore. Thanks so much, Katie. And I, I do love the question about how artists and, and people can get involved. Um, everybody has a role to play. So thanks um, for those examples. Um, one last question for Mansoor, and then we'll um, ask some of the audience questions. Thanks to folks for um, dropping those questions in the chat. Um, you know, Mansoor, I've faced this a lot, as I'm sure you have too, of going back and forth between Guantanamo as a very unique extreme place, um, but also as we're seeing a place that is connected in a lot of ways to other sites of violence. So how um, how do you see that the, um, the terror narrative has um, excluded Guantanamo, for example, from larger conversations about mass incarceration, abolition, Islamophobia? Um, and in your advocacy, have you tried to kind of break down some of those um, divisions and in a way de-exceptionalize? Guantanamo. Yeah, I would like to say something about the art, you know, before we jump to answer the question. You know, in Guantanamo, we weren't allowed to have any kind, like for the first years, allowed to have any pens, papers, or books. 
in 2010, however, we managed when Obama failed to close the detention, we were in hunger strike, as they call it, a form of a jihad. So I, I remember Ron DeSantis, in 2018, we hit an interview that said detainees would conduct jihad. Again, that it is the demonizing even the prisoners in Guantanamo. We were doing a peaceful protest that was viewed as jihad. So in 2010, we managed to negotiate with the administration. Finally, they sat with us what they call us a terrorist and negotiate about the improvement of living condition in the camp. One of the uh, our demand were were uh, art, uh, uh, you know, making art. They said, "You guys, as a terrorist." You don't know how to paint, so we have to prove them that we can paint, basically. Then we were allowed to have art class. So, as you know, Alia, I know the process of making art was confiscated, destroyed, and so on. Some of the art actually got to Guantanamo. In 2017, we started the first art, art exhibition in New York and at Jane Joy, uh, at Jane Jay College, and the Pentagon gone crazy. They said they would, the spokesperson said they would burn art from Guantanamo and this art belonged to the to the government and many voices that give a uh, terrorist voice and so on and that led that Trump administration banned art from leaving Guantanamo and we spent around six years later fighting to get the art released from uh, Guantanamo so when people look at the art they said okay we can see what kind of people they are it's a way to humanize the dehumanize uh, people about uh, your question can you repeat your question please i'm really cold so i get <laughs> lost so, yeah. you can put back your jacket on if you want um yeah, exactly. now the question was just um for a long time guantanamo was seen as exceptional and unique and it is unique in a lot of ways but as we've talked today it's um there are a lot of connections to other yeah yeah sorry, so yes. yeah so just it. how has yeah. the narrative been used to um prevent guantanamo from being part of larger conversations around mass incarceration for example you know guantanamo as you see guantanamo is as, as we say is one of the most secretive and the most expensive prison in the world first secondly it's unique in many ways but at the same time it becomes a symbol of injustice lawlessness abuse of power and and, and so on and and Guantanamo give some kind of, I'm not going to say legitimacy, but encourage other people to to do the same. You know, even like last year, one of the French uh, French politicians was calling to create Guantanamo in France. They said we create Guantanamo without uh, without torture. So Guantanamo uh, legalized. I'm not going to say legalized, but also at the same time in like. Those countries look at the United States, their policies, and so on, and do the same. And if, if we look at the uh, now, anyone would criticize the United States, they would say, "Look, what uh, Guantanamo, uh, what uh, what you have, Guantanamo." And I again, I derail from your question. Sorry, I couldn't focus. No, that's okay. Everything you said was 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 good. No, I, I'm not talking what I said. Sorry, I, I just I couldn't collect my thoughts. No, it's okay, Mentor. You know, I think we're actually going to move to um, some audience Q and A's. But um, if anything um, comes up that you want to share before we wrap up, you can do that too. Um, so, Maha, I think you're going to start um, with some of the audience Q and A's. Yes. So this is one of the questions we got um, from the audience. So, if the ICJ rules in favor of Israel, is this the beginning of the end of the significance of international law? Can I ask Kate to answer this? <laughs> sure. I was I was waiting for you, Sahar. Um, look, I think first and foremost, the ICJ really cannot rule in favor of Israel as a matter of law and based on the facts. Um, what we've seen over the past three months, and it's incredible that it, this horror has been going on for so long, we saw Israeli officials make admissions at the very start of this operation, what their intentions were. And those intentions were genocidal. They declared their attack against the Palestinian population in Gaza. And the 84-page the application put in by South Africa 
details over nine pages, the statements by senior Israeli officials who are in control of the apparatus of the state that has been bombarding and destroying Gaza and has been denying the population the basic necessities of life, food, fuel, electricity, water, medical supplies, while under constant bombardment. So the, the South African application is strong as a matter of, um, you know, based on the facts. And the ICJ jurisprudence on the duty to prevent genocide is also crystal clear that um, a state has the obligation to take whatever measures it can to prevent genocide from the moment there is a serious risk of genocide. And states have an obligation not to commit, incite, or be complicit in, among other forms of, of um, liability regarding genocide. And at this juncture where we are at, at, at the ICJ in the South Africa v. Israel case, what the International Court of Justice has to find to institute provisional measures is that there is a plausible case. And again, you don't have to even read in detail, but you should, the 84-page application by South Africa, and that plausible case based on existing case law is clearly made. So to the, to the question, should Israel prevail by majority in, in a ruling? Yes, I, I, we will have um, a decision that is contrary to the law and facts in the situation of Bosnia regarding Srebrenica, in the Rohingya case against, um, against Myanmar, and in the provisional measures decision in Ukraine v. Russia. And I would, I would, I anticipate that the ICJ will do the right thing and rule based on the facts and the law. And if it does not, then indeed, I think we are at a, a, a real moment um, where we need to step back and reassess the entire legal order because it will be a reflection of what many of us fear, um, power over power politics over justice. Um, Sahar, did you want to add anything? No one word. I totally support what Kate was saying. Okay. Thank you, Paul. It would be as a Palestinian. Mm -hmm. You don't want even to hear the level of frustration or how Palestinians would look for the international human rights and humanitarian law uh, uh, system after if if this fails actually right so we will all be eagerly watching and advocating for the palestinians um so i'm not sure maybe this is a question for katie and then um i have a sort of a follow-up for Mansoor on this basis. But um, couldn't the ICC or ICJ be used for Guantanamo cases? Yeah, um, I'll answer this very briefly. And I, I gave part of an answer, I think, already that we did go to the International Criminal Court and we did have an investigation opened. Um, to, to kind of explain that, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over the uh, over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, and in some cases aggression, but those first three crimes, when committed on the territory of an ICC member state or by a national of an ICC member state, the United States is not a member of the International Criminal Court, but in its so-called war on terror, on its global torture program. The United States carried out torture on many, um, on the territory of many ICC member states. So whether it was Afghanistan or Poland, Lithuania, Romania, Jordan, Djibouti, the list can go on um, and certainly goes on at length when we're talking about those countries that assisted torture flights. Um, 
the ICC has jurisdiction for crimes that occurred on those on on that ter those states' territory, and it's on that basis that the appeals chamber of the International Criminal Court authorized the investigation of the U.S. torture program, so torture that occurred on Afghanistan and, and then in the black sites. Um, again, the current prosecutor, Kareem Khan, has, quote, deprioritized. But you couldn't look at Guantanamo per se. We mm -hmm. argue that Guantanamo and the torture that is happening and continues to happen at Guantanamo is a continuing crime from torture that began in countries like Afghanistan or Poland, Lithuania, Romania, because individuals, men who are in Guantanamo had been held and tortured on the territory of ICC member states. So that's a question that the court didn't fully get to, but I would continue to argue that it's a continuing crime. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, Mansoor, a quick question. Oh, sorry, did anyone else? I wanted to reflect very briefly on this point that Kate ended in, in the Palestinian context. Actually, torture is, is a very systematic policy in the Israeli prisons, and Israel is not a member for the ICC. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the uh, prosecutor in the ICC didn't include it so far torture as a crime for the investigation for the case of Palestine for very similar uh, uh, discussion over where the torture happened. If it happens inside Israel, so they claim they don't have jurisdiction and we're claiming that it starts in the occupied territories and continue in the, uh, like in the first moment of the arrest and continue inside the detention facilities inside Israel. Thank you so much, Sahar. Um, Mansoor, a quick question for you. Um, have you pursued any legal remedies for any compensation or redress in your case? Uh, no, no, not, not like, I discussed that with my lawyers, but it's, you know, I, I think we discussed this with you, Maha, too. It needs a lot of work, a lot of, even now when we read some of the uh, protection the US government, they said nobody is willing to touch this case to allow to former Guantanamo detainees to sue the US government. So we haven't found any, like, any lawyer who are interested in pursuing the, the case for us. And from what, uh, from what I learned from my lawyers that we cannot so the U.S. Uh, government, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. We are now we are talking about it. We are trying to find lawyers, uh, you know, uh, anyone who can help in this. But it's going to take years. Thanks, Munzer. I think um, we have time for one last question, and I'm I'm seeing the question of, of bumping up. Um, the question sort of I had asked earlier, which is why does the terror narrative exclude Guantanamo from other discussions? And um, I'll just take a, a pass at answering this first, which is, um, you know, like Mansoor said, there's so much secrecy around Guantanamo. There's a lack of access to the men at Guantanamo. Um, very few people can speak to them on the phone to visit them. Um, so much information remains classified um, despite efforts to to bring information out. And it's really by design. I mean, Guantanamo was created in Cuba um, so that it would be separate um, from US prisons and separate from public scrutiny in the same way that um, there's just more access to, to see what's going on in the US in your, you know, in your backyard. And so I think that's part of the reason. And then, you know, Mansur, maybe you can touch on this too, this um, label of terrorism that's come up a lot. Um, you know, the majority of the men at Guantanamo have never even been charged with a single crime, but because they are there under this national security um, justification, because they were at one point labeled suspected terrorists, that label doesn't go away. There's no, um, there's no, sorry, we were wrong. Um, now, you know, rebuild your life. Um, the stigma follows many people. And so, Mansoor, maybe you can just say a word on that, but, you know, Maha and I and Ali and others who've been organizing these anniversary events for years have made it a point to um, bring Guantanamo 
into conversations like we're doing here, um, because both because there are connections um, with other um, with other issues like mass incarceration, for example, um, and because it'll make our movement stronger. That's that's another reason um, to do this work and to build um, build connections, build organizing, build solidarity, because um, that's the way that we'll win and we'll be able to um, hopefully close Guantanamo. So I'll stop there, but Mansoor, do you just wanna yeah. say maybe how that um, narrative has contributed to the stigma that you and other brothers still face? You know, the narrative also like, because Guantanamo, again, they associate with the 9-11, the Homeland Security, security, classification, secrecy. And, you know, uh, when you look at Guantanamo, for example, now even the reporter who, one of the reporters who reporting about Guantanamo, the military commission, it seems there is some kind of legal process uh, is going there. Military commission, the trials, 9-11, you know, this is called, and so on. And that's... That's how they uh, like one time was excluded from the mass incarceration, the notable mass incarceration. So, also the government in control of the narrative. Lawyers cannot speak openly. Uh, there is no kind of freedom for journalists to go to visit Guantanamo. And I have I have talked to many journalists who visit Guantanamo. They are not allowed to take any photos. They are not allowed to visit any camps. They are not allowed to control the narrative. And also. The, the only journalism that at Guantanamo Station now at Guantanamo, you know, uh, pictured Guantanamo as there is some kind of legal process. There is uh, a those military commission, there is like visits and so on. And a secrecy and also power. So, um, we are unfortunately um, running out of time, and this has been such an amazing conversation. And we wanted to ask all of you if there are any closing remarks um, that you want to leave us with, anything you want to impart to the audience um, about what we can do, for example, to further justice for the Palestinians, for the men at Guantanamo, the men who've been released, and for the, the cause of justice in general. So I would like to start, first of all, we all have a role to play. We all have a duty uh, to do. Like either you're a victim, I'm a victim, but I, I refuse to be the role of victim. Speak out, you know, uh, speak the truth. Uh, you know, this kind of demonstration, protests, uh, awareness, uh, question everything. Also, uh, whatever you are, a lawyer or a journalist or an uh, ordinary person, or yes, we all have a duty to, to fight for our humanity, to fight for justice and for the um, to fight the injustices. We all we all can do something, because because from what I learned and experienced that. Silence only another form of oppression. It also silence gives some gives some kind of legitimacy to oppressors to do more and more. But when people now you see now Gaza people start waking, calling for the demonstration, protest. Even we don't, we don't see any results, but it's going to come as long as we are fighting the, uh, against oppression, injustice, and, and so on. I think I would pick the idea of Kate and build on it on the People's Tribunals uh, as an alternative in discussing legal issues where we cannot succeed in the proper courts. It's very important and we experienced that in the past in the Palestinian context as the Russell Tribunal on Palestine. And I think it's very, very important now to bring such platforms back to discuss what's going on and not just on the genocide now in the occupied territories, but connect and, and, and develop these connections as our discussion today between policies of torture, arbitrary detention, and all these grave breaches for the international law from the Palestinian context, in the U.S. context, in other contexts, and 
and find solutions and suggest and educate and, and use these issues in order to build a movement. And I think another point from my side is the call for the boycott, divestment and sanction. We should continue in these efforts. And this is the most powerful way to find all the complicit companies, private companies or other institutions in these uh, uh, crimes accountable. This is the power that we have as a people if the justice systems would be blocked for us. And I'll just end by saying, don't give up. We can't give up. I mean, we have a, a genocide happening at this very moment in the occupied Palestinian territory. And there are men who remain detained without charge in Guantanamo. And who knows what else the United States and other powerful states are doing that we are not aware of at this moment. So we can't give up. We can be very frustrated. We can even be angry but we can't give up and we have to continue to find support in conversations like this with like-minded people and push those who don't share our views, whether it's educating them and, and confronting them with facts. Um, that is something that we all can do. And I think to the questions about special skills that people may have, try and bring them to bear, whether it's it's in the arts or the creative spaces, especially. I think um, that is something for those of us who maybe don't have as much creativity, having people to think through other ways of telling a story, telling the truth is really, really helpful. Um, but don't give up. Thank you so much um, to all of you for that and um, for ending on that note, Katie. Um, I wanted to just share a few um, ways, um, additional ways for people to get involved. Um, Maha, please feel free to um, add anything if I've forgotten it. So um, first, tomorrow, as we've talked about, is January 11th, the 22nd anniversary of the opening of Guantanamo. Um, we and um, partners all over the country and in um, uh, countries across the globe um, will be um, having vigils and rallies tomorrow. And so um, I think we have a link here of actions that you can take. Um, if you're interested in stepping outside and gathering with other folks, please do. Um, that link should also have some other actions. I think maybe a letter writing um, campaign to President Biden as well. Um, we also have the Guantanamo Survivors Fund. We, we haven't had a chance to talk about that much here, but um, it is a great um, group of organizations that we've worked closely with, including um, Maha's organization and Mansoor is a part of that effort, um, where they um, are submitting grants to former, um, former detainees, Guantanamo survivors, um, to really help step in where the U.S. government has not and support them around some material needs. Um, another um, way to get involved, of course, around Palestine is um, to continue calling for a ceasefire. Um, there's a great toolkit by our partners at the U.S. campaign um, that I think we're also going to be sharing. Um, and this includes um, a January 26th day of action um, that will coincide with the genocide case that um, the Center for Constitutional Rights um, is litigating. There's a hearing on January 26th um, in California. So there will be some actions relating to the, related to that. Um, I'll also add that um, please stay tuned um, for more information about how to support CCR's upcoming Abu Ghraib trial um, in April um, against um, CACI, a private um, military contractor. Um, we're still trying to find ways to bring um, our clients here or elevate their voices. So, um, you know, stay tuned for some, I hope, exciting um, programming um, related to trial and of course the trial itself. Um, that's all I have for actions. Maha, did you want to add any others that I maybe missed? Um, I don't have, um, I guess I don't have many others, but I would say um, buy Mansoor's book, Don't Forget Us Here, about his time at Guantanamo. Um, definitely read the ICJ case uh, from South Africa on the genocide um, and follow all of the organizations here, especially Center for Constitutional Rights and Adamir, um, because they're doing the critical and crucial work that we need right now at this moment. Thank you all so much for joining us. 
Thanks. And I'll, what, I guess I'll get the last word on this. Um, the recording of this event will live at this link. So um, please share it with, with other folks. Um, we'll do our best to add some of the resources and links that we've shared to, I guess, the landing page if possible. Um, and ideally, if, if we'll be able to send out a thank you email with some of these resources if you registered. Um, so thanks again for, for joining us today. And um, thank you to our speakers, um, Sahar, Katie, Mansoor, um, to Jack and Ali, who are behind the scenes um, helping us keep this running. Um, and then of course, Rashida. Um, for interpretation um, and thanks thank you all for joining us today take care thank you so much thank you yeah bye bye